This is uh, an enormous honour for me to be here this morning. It's um, an absolutely extraordinary program as I looked recently over the next three days that you're all going to participate in. Indeed, it's a massive program. Everything from aged care to biodiversity, water security, impact on low impact, uh, sorry, low income households. And when you think about it, the whole issue of adapting to climate change really does eke into, pervade every aspect of uh, modern society. So I apologise in advance because the next few minutes I'm probably the only speaker you're not actually going to learn anything from. My role is, and I'm not embarrassed about this, just in a dumb sort of way, to set the scene, to get you fired up, to get the most out of this conference because each and every one of you have, has an important job to do out in the community leading this community so used to being comfortable and doing what it's done in the past, but to experience life perhaps differently in the future. You are change agents and a very important part of this conference is actually to listen, to be informed and then to mix, be fired up, leave this place and make change. Indeed, I don't envy any of you having to work out what of the parallel sessions you're going to uh, experience because you simply can't be in every place at one time. And I do commend Andrew, Jean, the extraordinary team of committed people that have put this amazing program together. Adaptation is seldom straightforward, notwithstanding seemingly irresistible logic to do so. I spent the last week or so in the Northern Territory uh, this time, a week ago, I was uh, spending two or three days in a college, in a school, on the Tiwi Islands, Melville Island. Um, the, Mel uh, the Tiwis have three or four townships, little settlements. And like so much of outback Aboriginal communities, there was a lot of rubbish around these places. It was an abhorrent experience to an outsider like me. Not the first time I've seen it, of course, but again, I was reminded such a beautiful environment, but rubbish everywhere. It was unsightly, spoiled a beautiful paradise. Why on earth did they do it? Well, there is, the answer is simple. They have been doing it for tens of thousands of years, and for the vast majority of that time, highly appropriately. You see, the rubbish of the past was shells, husks, skins of fruit, seeds, which found their place appropriately back in a natural environment, which was innocuous. But today the skins are high density polyethylene. The husks have been replaced by aluminium cans. The seeds are now the cellulose acetate comprising cigarette filters. And they do their respective jobs really well. These things are built tough and they hang around seemingly incompatible with the natural environment. And old habits die hard, unfortunately, with those local people. And their Aboriginal friends, of course, are not the only ones who struggle with the need to change behaviour and to adapt. We all become used to the status quo. It's comfortable, it's familiar, even though external logic might say that a traditional practice actually has become illogical. It culminates with uh, perhaps something like smoking, long ago proved to be highly dangerous, but still intoxicatingly irresistible. Of course, sometimes the decisions are made for us, especially for those of us who are going to miss our Fairfax broadsheet in the years to come. We'll be forced to adapt to something else, but so often we actually do have choice. And of course, here today, if, if humanity could have rid itself of its love affair with fossil fuels early enough, you may not have been needed here at all today. But this relationship remains strong. I guess Rio 20 plus 20 is the latest evidence of that. And whilst it has to be challenged, accepting its consequences and adapting to a different world is actually the real world. And the good news is that we're a clever species. We've done it before. And even if we've never actually, as a species, been responsible for global climate change, as I said, we have actually adapted to climate change in the past. From the Tiwi Islands, 
Last week I travelled deep into Arnhem Land, to the land northeast of the East Alligator River, an amazing place which in English we call Mount Borrowdale. Very few people are privileged to get to it, but uh, once there, a veritable treasure chest of uh, amazing Aboriginal art, crocodiles, extraordinary rock formations, barramundi, dancing brolgas, etc., etc. And in one sense, it's a place where time has stopped still, even though the evidence, of course, goes back 50, 55,000 years of um, human existence. I brought a uh, a book back by Andrew, sorry, David Roberts and Adrian Parker about the extraordinary art in this area. I'm no great appreciator of art, but it was so much in your face that uh, it was important to read it back and bring it back. And it was actually on the plane um, back that I actually read the first few pages. And poignantly, it didn't start with art. The first few pages didn't start with telling you how they chose the rocks, how they made their paintbrushes, how they developed the ochre. No. The first few pages were all about the environment, the changing environment in which they lived. Can I just read a few, a few sentences? For the much of the last 50 to 55,000 years, they inhabited a vastly different environment, one far more distant from the coast, more arid, much colder than the subtropical climate of modern times. Key aspects of the contemporary environment and human culture can be traced back to the period of transition between the Pleistocene and Holocene epochs, roughly 15,000 to 6,000 years ago. During this time, temperatures increased, sea levels rose. The receding shorelines closed the land bridge between northern Australia and New Guinea and channeling dynamic tidal rivers across the low-lying plains of western Arnhem Land. A cool, semi and woodland, sorry, semi-arid woodland habitat was recast into rich estuarine involvement and uh, under a monsoonal climate with the landscape permeated by vast saline flats, dense mangrove swamps. It was all changing. These climatic and ecological transformations provoked pivotal adjustments to the economy and cultural and the culture of local Aboriginal society. The migration of displaced coastal peoples and the new resources of an estuarine environment encouraged an increased population. Later on, from around 3,000 to 1,500 years ago, the estuarine environment was modified again by the development of freshwater swamps and billabongs, etc., etc. This heightened abundance resulted in a further and more decisive increase in population and a corresponding adjustment and diversification of technologies and survival strategies and new forms of social organisation. And so it goes on and on in an art book. An art book that actually started with the constant evolution of society having regard for changing climate. We've adapted before and notwithstanding the usual resistance led by a few King Canutes with their feet wet as the tide flows back in, we will adapt again because the urge to survive and prosper is of course a strong one. I've been encouraged this morning to say a few words about uh, a world that I'm familiar with, the world of, of business, the corporate world. We often bemoan the fact that uh, we have great foundation science in this particular country but fail to exploit, commercialise, translate it. And the business community is often at the root of this discussion, not entrepreneurial, not visionary, not smart. And uh, that's probably a bit too harsh, a bit too much of an overgeneralisation, but it actually is in the ballpark. As a species, we need business to provide goods and services which improve our quality of life, which assist us to adapt to change. But equally, business, as a massive part of humanity, needs itself to think beyond the implications of a short-term carbon tax starting in a few days to something much longer term, to have a strong grasp of the risks of actually not adapting itself. Last year I had the pleasure um, wearing my CSIRO hat of spending a little time with Jeffrey Imelt. He's the global CEO of GE. GE and CSIRO have had a long-term collaborative arrangement. GE is a very large company, an extraordinary technology-driven company with 36,000 scientists. At one um, 
the function that he was at, he gave a speech, he received questions afterwards, and a question from the floor came along the following lines. Why does GE devote billions of dollars into developing products and services around climate change when indeed it remains such a vexed issue? Jeffrey responded along the following lines. He said, yep, we've been in this area for a long time. We're driven by what our scientists have been saying for a long time. And he said, as CEO of this company, I want my scientists to tell me the moment they don't believe that uh, climate change is happening. But he said, we are also in touch with social scientists, not physical scientists, but people that understand the mood and preparedness of the community to accept change as well. He said, I would have liked to invested much more in this space 20 years ago, but the social scientists said, be careful, this will be difficult, particularly uh, when it gets to the political arena. In any event, to sum up, I found his answer refreshing, visionary, courageous, sensible, and actually in contrast to much of um, what is said by our business leaders here. That is work in progress. We need to encourage our business leaders here that actually this is all about business logic. It's just about being smart. It's just about seeing the, uh, the longer term opportunities. The framing of um, public communication, the public debate itself is very important. Science is important, application science particularly important, but so is the art of public communication. The community is not well served today by the climate science debate, you all know that. And accordingly, the agenda for adaptation suffers as well. Change is hard enough, but when science isn't given a fair go in the media, it is doubly hard. It is critical that as a broad community, we encourage excellence, not only in the science, but that art of communicating the science to the wider community especially in an era when the Fairfax Charter of Editorial in, in Independence appears to be um, in peril. I again congratulate the organisers this morning. I know you'll be treated to a fabulous smorgasbord of presentations. As I said at the outset, uh, I think really the success of this conference is actually now going to be up to you, though I'm sure all the presentations have been read, they've been prepared and rehearsed. And I say that because the most important objective of all of this is actually to receive the information, then to mix, connect, exchange notes, break down the silos, ensure that we can, as John Lennon almost said, give adaptation a chance. <laughs> I do take great pleasure in declaring the 2012 National Climate Adaptation Conference open. Thank you.